The following announcement has been paid for by the Wrestling Epicenter. Hey, hey everybody. Hey guys. Hello, ladies. Remember me? <laughs> Let me talk to you, dummies. It's now time. It's their time. TikTok. It's showtime. For the longest running wrestling talk show in history. We are huge. Gonna be cool. You're where it's at. You're smart like me. Tune in each and every week. You better keep listening. Or I'll come out of your computer and turn it on for you. Or else I'm gonna kick your sick of teeth in. We've been known by a few names. The needs of the many far outweigh the needs of the few. The interactive interview. Interactive interview. Oh, yeah. Interactive interview. The interactive interview. Interactive interview. The interactive interview. Interactive Wrestling Radio. Interactive Wrestling Radio. Interactive Wrestling Radio. Interactive Radio. Interactive Wrestling Radio. Interactive Wrestling Radio. The Blaze. Blaze, 12.60 a.m. The Blaze. The Blaze. Blaze. The Blaze Rock. And a lot of other names. Weekend Warrior of Wrestling. The Pile Driver. The Epa Wrestling Center. Street Count Wrestling. <laughs> the Hour Slab. But it's all one show. The Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. The Wrestling Epicenter. The Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter, dude. The Wrestling Epicenter, don't get off. And your host from day one. By ignorance or arrogance. James Walsh. Wake up, sleepyheads. Dr. Carolas. It all starts. What a rush. Oh, boomer sooner. Thank you very much. Wrong. <laughs> I got two words for you. Dumb. Yeah. Breaking necks and cash and checks. Burn. I've heard a lot about you guys. <laughs> Check it out. Get out of my face. <laughs> Woo. You win. But I'm desperately out of time. So what you gonna do when Blaze Mania runs wild on you? Now. This is Bruno San Martino, and you're listening to the interactive interview. Hello again, wrestling fans, and welcome to the Fury Hour. That's my Herb Abrams impression. Welcome, guys. Welcome, one and all, to another edition of Interactive Wrestling Radio right here on WrestlingEpicenter.com. Today, we're going to bring you two interviews that actually almost go an hour long each. As a result, I'm putting them up separately. Sometimes lately, I've been pairing them together if they've been likewise, like-minded interviews and putting them in one long episode i going to split these into two, and here's why. They both go, like I said, nearly an hour. So it is a fury hour, and they both tie back to the Herb Abrams UWF, which just was covered on Viceland's Dark Side of the Ring. I love that show, by the way. Dark Side of the Ring uh, is a show that's catered to men about my age who are me. Definitely catered directly for my interest base, not sure how many people are out there. They say they're getting great numbers, and I'm very happy for them for that. But it is definitely devised of content that is specifically in my wheelhouse of interests. And this one was no exception. In fact, this one was a story that needed to be told, because Herb Abrams is such an interesting character. Here's a guy who has all the quirks of a Vince McMahon and had some of that success in the early 90s. People forget how big UWF got and how much attention there was towards it because they did pay-per-view. They were on Sports Channel. Sports Channel was basically ESPN2, for lack of a better way of putting it. You know, there was ESPN and there was Sports Channel. Those were where you found your sports. And then, of course, MSG Network was another, but I digress. That might have been more in just my area, the New York, New Jersey area. Anyway, um, our two guests. First things first. He worked in the WWF as Sandy Beach. He was in the movie No Holds Barred in the UWF and in the WWF as well. He was our guest of this week. Sonny Beach joins us. One half of Wet n' Wild with Stevie Ray. Not suckers got to know Stevie Ray, but Stevie Ray the Wild Thing. We also got, also from the WWF and the UWF, He is now a sportscaster who does work with the Miami Marlins as well as other Miami-based sports teams down in Southern Florida. He was in wrestling as Craig 
DeGeorge. And this is a really good interview with him. Loved both interviews, as a matter of fact. Both are epic. Just great content in both interviews. Uh, I think you guys are going to enjoy it. So whichever one you're tuning into here at the Wrestling Epicenter, I hope you enjoy. I invite you to check out our store, WrestlingEpicenter.com slash Zen. Namaste, everybody. That's uh, just the name of the program we're using. That's why it's Zen. So click the store button on WrestlingEpicenter.com and you will be whisked away to our WrestlingEpicenter.com online merchandise store with a lot of great DVDs, action figures, t-shirts, and more. Check it out at WrestlingEpicenter.com slash Zen or just click that store button on WrestlingEpicenter.com. I want to apologize, uh, by the way, guys, for two different things. First, on the Sunny Beach episode, you might notice that I sound like I'm on the phone as well. That's because our audio equipment was not working. And the second thing is, I got the name wrong. I told a story to Greg DeGeorge before we started that when we interviewed Krista Joseph a couple years ago to promote Lucha Underground, uh, who, by the way, is back with the WWE now, Krista uh, Joseph, I said to him, for some reason I had it stuck in my head that I was going to call him Craig DeGeorge. And I did not. But uh, I told Craig that story before we started recording. And then, of course, I called him Chris in the intro. So what can you do? I'm going to blame the fact that I had an inner ear infection. In fact, I still do. And I'm on antibiotics. And I'm one of those guys. I don't drink. I don't take drugs. I don't do nothing. I am the unherb Abrams. And by doing that, I have the quirks of him just naturally, not not related to drugs. Um, anyway, that might have thrown me off my game. So my apologies if you don't like the audio quality of me on the Sunny Beach interview. And my apologies as well if you noticed that I was a little off my game with names while speaking to the great Craig DeGeorge. Hope you guys enjoy this interview right here on WrestlingEpicenter.com. Check out our store. Check out our archives for all those great interviews with other UWF names of the past, including the great Bruno San Martino, the great Mick Foley, Lisa Moretti, and so many others. Superfly, Jimmy Snuka, Ivan Koloff, a lot of guys that were in the UWF are in our archive section with great interviews talking about those golden days. It's time for the Fury Hour, the hour-long interviews. Didn't mean for them to be so long, but I think you guys are going to like them. Let's get started, and thank you again for tuning in right here on WrestlingEpicenter.com. Hi, gang. This is Bean Gene Orkelon from World Wrestling Entertainment, reminding you you're where it's at with the interactive interview right here online. Welcome back to the Wrestling Epicenter on the Newsmaker line with us right now is a gentleman I've wanted to have on for quite some time, and his name kind of came up because his voice was all over Viceland's Dark Side of the Ring last week, even though he wasn't interviewed for it. I am speaking of the former WWF and UWF announcer, Mr. Chris Cra I'm sorry, you see, he got stuck in my head. Craig DeJoseph, how are you doing today, sir? Well, James, you're off to a rough start. You missed my first and last name. But other than that, it's great to be with you. No wonder why I've been eluding you. That's Thank exactly you right. I told you Boy, the story. I forget quickly. Exactly. Off air, I told you the story about when I had Chris DeJoseph, who, uh, Chris DeJoseph, who writes WWE TV. Me, yes. Yeah. So there you go. That's If anybody's listening and wondering why, that's why I did that. But anyway. Yeah, that's a question. Does anyone listen? That's a good question. Uh, that's what I want. No, I'm just kidding. What's up? We do okay. We do okay. So, anyway, Dark Side of the Ring was last week. They talked about your former employer, Herb Abrams. I wanted to start out by saying, what did you think of what they did on Viceland last week? You know, I, I somehow my TiVo, and I've been taping it, I did not see the show. I'm dying to see it uh, uh, because I got to work with her very closely. I did not all, but I would say most of the UWF, I think Herb did a few of them himself. He did the play-by-play, -play, but he mm -hmm. was kind of running around, uh, very, very active. It was, it, he was a, one of the most bizarre people I've ever worked with, but I did like him. He was a likable guy. Uh, he even tried to pull off a pay-per-view show we did, and I think it was Bradenton or somewhere on the west coast of Florida called Beach Brawl. Right. I'm not sure if we had even more viewers than you have listeners right here, James. I, I don't know what the numbers were, but, I, but we had a lot of fun with it. 
other than the fact that the boogie woogie man kissed me in the middle of the show. He just came over. He was gross. He was 140 pounds of tattoos. He just came over and planted a kiss. Ah! <laughs> my uh, my wife got a kick up uh, at the time when it when it aired. Well, there might have been a time in the seventies that that <laughs> that the handsome Jimmy <laughs> Valiant would have been a that would have been a big thing to. <laughs> oh, it was gross. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Um, so I would have thought you would have been the perfect person to have on to talk about this for Viceland. Why were you not contacted? Any ideas? Well, I'm sorry, one more time? I would have thought you would have been the perfect person to come on to talk about this because of your ability to verbalize and, and, and express your views on these things. Were you contacted to be part of the Viceland documentary at all? No, I, no actually I wasn't. And, uh, you know, I'm a, I was involved with a lot of these uh, topics. Uh, at least in my era when I was at the WWF, and then I did the UWF, which was a national show. It was on Sports Channel. America. Right. Herb was basically a great wrestling fan, and he was such so much of a fan, a mark, if you will, that he and he had money uh, that he you know was able to gather all these pretty big names. Lou Albano was on. I did the show with Bruno San Martino. That's right. We did it across the street from Madison Square Garden at, at the Penn Plaza, if I recall, in the city. And, uh, it was, you know, it was kind of a big card, some big names, a small ballroom type atmosphere, but it was fun. Um, and uh, he, was, he was really a unique guy to work with. Absolutely. And, and I'll ask you a few questions. You already asked about the, or talked about the pay-per-view, but I wanted to talk about your experience. You said Herb Abrams is a big wrestling fan. How did you get involved in our crazy wrestling industry? Oh, well, that's a good question. So, so I go back to... Uh, you know, and I always tell my kids and other people this about getting an internship, uh, doing something for free that you really like doing uh, because you never know how it's going to pay off. And for me, it was a meeting with Bruce Beck, who's a well-known sportscaster in New York at WNBC and used to be at MSG. I met Bruce at a, at a, a Rutgers Syracuse football game when I went to college at Syracuse. And I asked him, are there any internships? And he gave me the name of a guy named Pete Silverman at MSG Network. So I called Pete and I got an internship, which would have been after my junior year, I believe it was, because I did I did AAA baseball my mm. my sophomore year. So and so I went into the city every day on a on a train. They paid for the train, but that was it, and uh, no money. I went to the garden, basically a nine to five, and I did. There wasn't a lot going on. They didn't have the Yankees then. I I, I remember. Believe it or not, I would go to the library, big library in New York, New York City Library, and, mm-hmm. and, and copy microfiche articles of old Ranger games and, you know, whatever you could do. But when you're there every day, you make an impression on people. And a long story short is one of the guys was named Phil Harmon, executive vice president. And, you know, he gets to see you every day, coming in with a good attitude and excited. And he went to work for Vince McMahon. And we kept in touch. And my first job, I was in West Virginia. I was a sports director in a little old market, middle of nowhere. Oak Hill, West Virginia. I get a call from Phil Harmon. Hey, would you like to work in the WWF? And I'm like, whoa, the national TV. You know, mm-hmm. So I went up for an interview, and I got the job. Absolutely. And I've done a lot of interviews with announcers who have their name changed i don't know maybe to protect the innocent i'm not sure but why did they change your name to craig to, to craig to joseph good story my real name is craig minervini that's mm-hmm. the name i go by i should have kept it probably a different name i did mm-hmm. use a different name in my uh, in college craig roberts because my middle name is robert and i had a better flow to it but basically uh mcmahon didn't like the italian sounding name it was more of a in vogue those days, people changed their names, shortened their names, made it a little easier. The thing for me was I never got wind of that in an interview or anywhere. And I was at the uh, Sun Dome on the campus of the University of South Florida. Uh, my first ever you know, visit to a WWF event, I had been hired, but I was only supposed to watch. And all of a sudden, it's, hey, let's use the kid. And, and Gene Oakland down the hallway, screams, hey, the big guy wants to use you tonight. Uh-huh. I said, great. I, I said, when? It was like 7.05. He said, in about 25 minutes. I said, okay, that sounds good. You know, I had the WWF jacket. I just wasn't supposed to work. I was going to observe. And he turned away and looked back at me. He goes, oh, by the way. I said, what's that, Gene? He wants you to change your name. What? 
change my name. When? Now it's seven ten. I got 20 minutes. Now, this isn't West Virginia, James. This isn't Fargo, North Dakota. This is national television. Whatever name I use is going to be national. I mean, people go through weeks, months, lifetimes thinking of a name they want to be if they ever got famous. Mm. And I had 20 minutes. So Gene came over. This is a true story. There was a phone book there, and we started going through the phone book. Mm. You know, and, and yeah, this name, Craig Luna, was a name I remember. Gene said, what do you think about Luna? No, no, no. And I came up with, I, I, you know, after 10 minutes, I was like, oh, my God, 720. I got, I'm doing my first TV thing, which is supposed to be the stress, right? Mm-hmm. And I got to come up with a name. And I, and I thought of my mother's maiden name came to me. Oh. And I called her up and I said, I, don't, I hope I don't take the family name down, but I, I'm comfortable with Craig DeGeorge. And the family liked it until they saw me on the air. And now I don't talk to any of them. Oh. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, okay. But, so that's that's. That's how I went with it. Yeah. So my, my cousins kid me that I brought the name down. And I said, I finally elevated the DeGeorge name. All right, Mr. DeGeorge. Awesome. Well, uh, I wanted to give you props, by the way. That's a pretty good Gene Okerlund impression. Hey, kid. He was the best. Let me, <laughs> he'd, he'd be talking to the stewardess. Let me, wh- sweetheart, why don't you come away with me and give it all up? <laughs> Hold her hand. Uh, <laughs> I love that guy. I, I, I kept in touch with him in the last few years of his life. A few times, James, we were this close. He was in Brooklyn in a Nets game. I was covering a hockey game. You know, we just almost met Kutten. My son was playing hockey. Gene's son, of course, played in the National Hockey League. Todd and we, we met. And we were going to meet at the uh, in Ellerton. And, you know, it was one of those things. We, next game, next time. And I am so sad, really, that I never got to see him again. Mm. Uh, it had been too long, and he was a mentor and a just a wonderful, not only the greatest uh, broadcaster to me in the WWF ever that didn't do play-by-play, uh, not though in wrestling, for mm-hmm. that matter. The best interviewer ever. Nobody can come close. Nope. But, but a great mentor and a, just a nice man. Absolutely. So this is kind of my golden years for wrestling. This is kind of when I fell in love with it. I'm 38 now, so I would have been, you know, five, six, seven, eight years old when you were there. And I guess mm-hmm. my question is, I romanticize about that time as like the golden years. Do you look back at that as the golden years of wrestling? Yeah. I mean, for me, um, you know, growing up in New York, I was very familiar with the WWWF thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was on channel nine and I, and I really loved watching Vince McMahon. I, I his, his expressions and I'm not just saying it cause I later worked for him. Actually, I worked for him twice cause I did play by play for the XFL as well. Mm-hmm. I just liked the theatrics and, and his co- his call and his seriousness and uh, and that was that was the a different era obviously in the seventies but that's when I first started watching it. Now I can't say I was a monster fan, but when it came on I would watch it and knew the you know the names of the day. And uh, so this thing that came at me in the eighties uh, was unfamiliar to me. I didn't know much much beyond Hulk Hogan and and Randy Macho Man Savage. Right. Um, but. But, you know, they, they were hiring me. And I really do think this, James. I think they wanted a, a local, like a, more of a sports guy, more of a guy who was a meat and potatoes sports guy right? rather than a screaming wrestling guy or a fan, you know. you know. So I had to brought a different approach to it, I think. Maybe more because smooth. That was my style. Or, you know, whatever. I was a young sports guest growing, but, but I, I would approach sports. Look, I'm telling you, I, I've been in – Every sporting event you can imagine, I've covered everything, mm-hmm. and, and fortunately, in my career. And I will put up Hulk Hogan coming into the ring in a packed house with I'm a Real American playing. That moment, that excitement, the crowd, with any moment I've ever been around. And I'm not talking about WrestleMania 3. I'm talking about uh, Thursday night at the Buffalo Auditorium or, or in the Keel Center in St. Louis or in Paducah, Kentucky, wherever you were. When he came in the ring with that music, and I'm on that stage either bringing him up for an interview or watching his match, as exciting as anything. So I, I really, it was a thrill. It was the glory days. I didn't realize it then. I knew it was hot. It was on all the markets. It had a tremendous, uh, you know, uh, following, and and also just the recognition I was getting, even even having not been on the air at all, was shocking to me because I'd just been on a, a week or two and people already knew my name. Awesome. Yeah, that's, 
Incredible. And you mentioned Hulk Hogan, and I mentioned to you on Twitter, I was going to ask you this question. I bought this tape, Hulkamania 3, and it features you with a <laughs> sit-down interview with Hulk, who yes. seems unbelievably detached in the interview. I, I don't know why, but he just seemed like he was generally in a bad mood. Do you have any memories of that? <laughs> was he in a bad mood? I don't remember the bad mood. Mm -hmm. I do remember the interview. We went out on, if, if this is the one we're talking about. The boat, yep. We didn't talk previously. We're on a boat in the Long Island Sound. I think we took it out of Connecticut because that's where the WWF headquarters were. And here's what I remember. It was not a big boat, so almost like a racing or speed type boat uh, with, with like a front bucket seat and then that little back seat, which was typical of kind of cars then. It went all the way across. Mm -hmm. it wasn't, they weren't separate. Uh, here's what I remember about it. <laughs> I'm sitting next to Hogan with our if you can picture this, we're sort of on the top of the boat with our feet on the seat of the boat mm -hmm. in, the back, in the back row to give the cameraman some room to shoot the interview. I'm on his left. He's on my right. Before we shoot the interview, he goes, now Hulk is what, 6'6"? Six, six? Yeah, well, they Three said 6'8", six, but I think legit he's 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, yes. He was 6'6", six, 6'5", six, six, you know, 300. I'm, I'm 5'10", 170 probably at the time, uh, maybe 180. No, probably one set. What well, anyway? He says to me, "Hey, brother, would you mind sitting down on the seat?" And I'm looking at him like, "What? Could, could you?" So, so he, yeah, I guess so. So instead of sitting now, he's already eight, ten, you know, he's a foot taller than me. <laughs> I've got to sit below the seat. He, awkwardly, you never would do this, right? Right now I'm I'm four feet lower than him probably looking up at it very awkward, you know it was almost like Vince's thing when Andre the Giant came in you know those those cameras were put on the bottom of the of the uh, floor to shoot up make him look like he was thirty feet tall right right and I think that's what Hogan had in mind to make him so <laughs> it was an awkward uh, angle to say the least I don't remember his his. Uh, him being, you know, upset. It was kind of a neat thing for me to have yeah. Hogan one on one on this interview that lived forever on on what we call those Coliseum videotapes. Absolutely, I just remember they cut in close. Like the interview started, it was like a real tight shot of your face, and I thought this is kind of strange. And then they zoom out, and there's Hulk. I have you know. a picture in my <laughs> office, James, of that of that moment, and it's funny when I look at it. I keep looking at me sitting down and looking up, and I'm, uh, you know, five feet high, like the, on the king's throne. All right. So the purpose of having you on was to talk a little bit about that UWF run. And how different was it working for Abrams UWF than Vince McMahon's WWF? Well, it was completely different. One was uh, was the hottest thing going, one of the biggest shows, if not the biggest show in syndicated television in the country. And I only had a, let's face it, I had a small part, small role in that, but it was fun to be around it. I was Gene Oakland's basically backup, but I got to do the biggest events other than main event that he did on, which was the NBC show. And I, and I would do the interviews with the wrestlers, you know, sometimes a hundred, 120 a day. We would go to certain cities on a, on a dark match where, where we just do those interviews, which were at the time custom made for the show. And I got to, I was in on everything. So that was a cool job for me, even though Gene, Gene, look, Gene was the man, right? He was, he was the master, but uh, the number two banana, me, um, it certainly didn't get a lack of airtime. I was all over the place, everywhere. So that, that was great. Now, I went to the UWF. I had a little bit of a name, obviously, in wrestling. So when I left the WWF, I would get these calls. I did some of these uh, wrestling shows back to Japan. I would go over with Oliver Humperdinck in Tampa and voice these shows for Hiro Matsuda, mm. who would bring over these shows that I think they were like Mexico versus Japan. I remember there was a Corona logo. Not coronavirus, <laughs> Corona beer logo in the middle of the ring. And Jushin Thunder Liger was one of the wrestlers. So anyway, I got a call. I don't remember from who. I, it might have been a guy named Brian Rico, who I got to know a little bit in New York and, and asked me to do it. And maybe probably from some WWF contacts. And, uh, you know, it was a small venue. But I knew a lot of the people because many of them, I think you had Sonny Beach. Is he on your show or coming on your show? He was just on yesterday, as a matter of fact. Yes, he sir. was on yesterday, right? Well, he was on, he was in there. And uh, a bunch of guys, I knew almost all of them because they were all pretty big names. He didn't go for these, who's that guy? Right. He had every guy virtually right out of their WWF days. And it was a 
What year was that, would you say, 90, 91, around there? Uh, well, I, I, I'm an encyclopedia. It was October 1st, 1990 that it first aired. Okay, that's what I figure. Okay, so 19, So it was right after these guys had WWF exposure, and that's why I probably was able to get it on national TV, Sports Channel America. And, uh, you know, I worked with Lou Albano, who I did not know from the WWF. He had left there before I got there. Hmm. So that was cool getting to know him, one of the great wrestling personalities of all time. And it was different. Uh, you know, it was like you know, a smaller time in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was doing play-by-play -play on those shows, and it was fun. I look, Believe me, I look forward every time the flying. I'm from New York, to fly up back to New York. We were at Madison Square Garden. We were across the street in a, in a small ballroom with, with too much lighting. and uh, <laughs> But it was a lot of fun. Awesome. And how was working with Bruno? Uh, I liked, I, look, I got to know Bruno from my days at WWF. And although Vince did the call with him, um, I, and I always respect him because I remember I watched him in the 70s, like most ki kids who watched wrestling in the mm -hmm. 70s. So he was a, a hero to me, but uh, he was a uh, he was a pro's pro. Uh, he did not like the theatrics of wrestling. He liked uh, the, the, the style that he had with the black trunk and one hour matches and approached it as serious as uh, – Probably as Michael Jordan would, mm -hmm. pro would approach a basketball game, if you would. Uh, last dance, last chance in the ring, whatever the case was for Bruno. And I enjoyed work with him. Was he the most exciting broadcaster you ever heard? No. That was his <laughs> style. He was pretty much black and white. And he was uh, incredible integrity. And I loved working with him. You already mentioned Beach Brawl. It was a uh, pay-per-view. I actually ordered it as yeah. a kid. And you did. The, uh, so you were the one. <laughs> that's what what they did it cost you? Do you remember? Fourteen ninety-nine. Nineteen bucks. You got a good deal. That was a pretty good show. It was a pretty good show. And they describe it on the documentary as the worst pay-per-view of all time. Uh, I think they mean the numbers more so than the, the actual product because... I've gone back and rewatched it, and it's not bad. It's not a bad show, ultimately. Um, what is your memories of that, and do you think that was kind of the first real sign that stuff wasn't going well for Herb? Well, Herb was trying to be, you know, Vince Jr. Jr., right, and get, right. get his product over. And I, I'm assuming, I don't know, that I didn't see the show, so I'm assuming from a business standpoint it was a disaster. And it cost a lot of money for those satellites to do a live Mm. Uh, I believe our the UWF shows were on tape and edited. If I'm not mistaken, they were, I don't think they were live. They were what they would call live on tape, right? Which right. saved some money. You know, you edit it later. That was obviously a pay per view that was a live show, so it cost money for the satellite and so on. And you got to pay everybody. Um, so, but no, from my standpoint, it was exciting. You know, first of all, it was live, which you always, if you're a broadcaster, you love live. Mm -hmm. And and then I got to work with, you know, all those guys you mentioned. I actually have the, the VHS here somewhere, and I like to pull it out and watch it one day to see it. But, by, again, I, I remember that awful, awful moment with the Boogie Woogie Man. <laughs> and, uh, and other than that, uh, you know, and that was there's nothing scripted about that. He just came over, he was, and I don't know why he bothered me, but, he, you know, uh, but it was a fun show, as I recall. I don't. Rem I can't even tell you what happened in the in the actual matches. I don't remember it. I mm -hmm. have to look back at it. But I know I had fun doing it. I think I had a tuxedo too, which was neat. Yeah, yeah, you did have a tux on. Um, right. All right. So 1992 hits, and it seems like those TV t shows are harder to find on TV. They're on more sporadically. Sometimes they're repeats. Is this about when you ducked out and and were no longer part of UWF in 1992? Yeah, is that when when I I'm sorry. Is that when you uh, were kind of exited stage left? Yeah, basically. Um, you know, I don't remember the the very end. And I would get, like I said, I didn't do every show, but I did most of them. And you mm -hmm. know, what I do remember is I didn't get paid for the last show. <laughs> oh. Uh, whenever that show was, I never got the check. I don't remember when did her, when did her pass away. Nineteen ninety six. Oh, it was a, so it was a few years later. Yes, sir. Ninety six. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think you kind of sensed though that the business was going down. Obviously, I didn't get paid the last show, so I wasn't going to go back unless I got paid. And um, you know, it had its little run. I think he, really, I think it was a miraculous type run for a guy who was a, basically it was he in the per perfume or jewelry business or something, and, uh, and clothing, you know, to find himself clothing, clothing for large clothing. for large yeah. ladies, yeah. 
<laughs> clothing, right, right. For but oh, that's right. But he, could, but I'll tell you one thing: you could not wear perfume around him. If you had perfume, forget it. There was no perfume. He was nuts. This guy. If you had perfume, forget it. You couldn't come within, and uh, you know, no lady, nobody could come within a hundred feet of him. And he was very particular. He would have been good today because the door handles had to be like brushed with of his limo with a with a handkerchief before he hit the door hand. Oh, you know, I, I remember he was very peculiar. But today he'd be a perfect coronavirus guy. <laughs> you know, be very careful with the netting and the gloves. I mean, he was ahead of his time. Uh, but uh, he a very, very, very unique man. No, no doubt about it. Uh, Herb Abrams. Very cool. So I did my research to find you um, many years ago when I pulled out an old tape and saw you, and I thought, I wonder whatever happened to him. And I found out that you are a very successful sportscaster. You've done Notre Dame football. You are currently with Miami Marlins. Um, so I guess my question is, do you want to tell people that don't know where Craig DeGeorge went after wrestling? Yes, well, uh, I, I, look, I didn't want to leave the WWF, but it was, uh, it was a quick exit. I, liked, I really enjoyed the job, and I got let go. I was actually kind of shocked because I thought they, they liked what I did. Uh, I know it was nothing personal with Vince. It would prove that uh, and hire me for the XFL years later to do play-by-play. Mm-hmm. Went up there, met him again, always enjoyed working for him. To me, he was like a tough coach, um, incredibly insightful, incredibly smart. And I, I really loved working with the guy, no matter where it was. For me to get to know him, you know, a kid from Long Island who, who didn't think about getting into wrestling, but always wanted to be a sportscaster, in the uh, footsteps of Marv Albert. Uh-huh. Uh, by the way, I was, I was a finalist, James, in the uh, Marv Albert uh, sound alike. Can I get a uh, yes out of you, Vinna? Yes, and the foul, and Mike Fratello wants to talk it over. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Uh, so that was me. So, you know, to work for that closely with Vince, for Vince to know me, to, to have a relationship with him and, uh, was, was super. But I didn't want to leave. I got let go. Um, things happened. New guy came in, that kind of thing. And uh, so it was a great couple of years. I kept the doors open and ended up working for him later in life as well. But I moved on. I actually went back to, believe it or not, my brother owned a comedy club on Long Island uh, that some famous comedians like Jerry Seinfeld and Eddie Murphy worked at and starred at before they were big names. I know them. Uh, I knew Eddie. I actually didn't know Jerry, but I knew Eddie. And to this day, you would know who I am. Hmm. And a bunch of other comedians. Kevin James uh, was a family friend. He opened up for my brother. And later, my brother would open up for Kevin, and Kevin would get me in his movie. Here Comes the Boom. Here Comes the Boom. That's right. Which I am a ring announcer. Uh, thanks to uh, you know our long relationship. I knew Kevin since he was uh, in his early 20s. Rosie O'Donnell. I went to school with Rosie. Went to the junior prom with her sister. Would this she have been started her comedy? Gil- huh? Gilbert Gottfried. Would he have been around around that same area that same time? You know what? I don't. I, I, he may have come out there. I don't remember him coming out. Jay Leno was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jackie Mason from older. Uh, Rich Jenny. You know an old, the older group of comedians that were then young comedians. Andrew Dice Clay was out there often. A uh, bunch of com. Dennis Wolfberg, who was very big uh, in his day. Um, Ray Romano. Wow. Come out there. And uh, I didn't know all of them. I knew most of them because I worked there as a, uh, so actually coming back from national TV, I was almost a brought up some of the guy's jokes because I would be back to waitering and managing the comedy club uh, in, in between jobs. Ah. You know, I remember one of the comedians was one minute he's uh, going to dealing with Randy Macho Man Savage. The next minute he's dealing out cheese boards. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So I did that for a little bit, bought some time. I did enjoy. My mother worked in the office. My brothers were all there. It was a fun environment. We had uh, just a good time there at the comedy club. And then I was sending my tapes out, and I wound up getting a job down in Florida, and I really never left. I I worked for the ABC affiliate West Palm. I ended up going to Miami. My timing was great because it was the year of the Panthers, and I'm a huge hockey fan. I played hockey my whole life. Uh, went to the Stanley Cup final. I got I got to cover them. I knew the sport backwards and forwards. I was a Ranger fan back in the early seventies mm-hmm. and followed the sport. And then and then the next year the Marlins won the World Series, and so I got to cover that. And then uh, of course the Canes were national champions. Jimmy Johnson, Don Shula. It really was a good time to be down here. Pat Riley arrived. Uh, covered many of those Knicks and Heat rivalry. They can never get by Jordan. Obviously nobody did. And then, um, and then I went on to work, do some network stuff, as you mentioned, Notre Dame football, 
and the XFL. And, uh, and then in, in the early 2000s, I moved over to the team side and I worked for the Marlins and the Panthers really since then. I had a little moment where I wasn't working for the Panthers, but I do both NHL and uh, Major League Baseball, along with some other stuff on the side. Very cool. And working for the Marlins, they've done a few Legends Nights, Legends of Wrestling Nights. And has that been cool? Have you gotten a chance to meet some of your old buddies from, from the wrestling business with those nights? Yeah, I did one. The one year that we did it, the first time we had, they actually had the ring and they did a show. And so I did the play by play with a mic, oh. uh, with a, uh, to the P- a PA type mic with Brett. The Hitman Hart was on there, and I think maybe even Jimmy Hart or somebody else with us. I, I even brought up my old light blue wrestling challenge uh, WWF jacket, which oh. didn't fit, by the way, <laughs> quite as well oh. as it did then. And uh, in fact, Tom Kohler, uh, one of our guys, got out and hit somebody with a chair. I think it was Goldberg or one of those guys. And I also remember Brutus Beefcake's wife getting into a tremendous argument with another lady of some, somebody. It was like a big almost brawl at the park that was not scripted. I was going to ask, was uh, that for real or was that like a plan? That, yeah. that was not scripted. But yeah, that, those were fun nights. I saw the Beastie Boys later, but they didn't. They stopped doing the actual wrestling show, which I thought was cool after the game. Um, but they still have the guys out there. And, and yeah, it's always a kick. All right. My kid loves Here Comes the Boom, by the way. So when I read that you were in it, I went back and rewatched it. And yeah, that's really cool to see, see in there. That's a great movie. One of, the, one of the greatest things I've ever done from a fun standpoint, I got to work with Henry Winkler, uh, was that scene in Boston. And uh, the, the script was, and it's funny how it goes, the script was so short, I probably could have read it in three seconds. It was like a wrestler from Boston, uh, record 0-0, Scott Voss. That was the script. That's it. So my brother being in with Kevin James, you know, I got like a kind of an in there. So I asked my brother, Richie, who's also in the movie, and has been a lot of Sandler movies and Kevin's movies. With He's a very funny stand-up comedian. Oh. Uh, look him up, if you, Richie Minervini. And anyway, so I asked Richie, can I, can I add lib? Can I go longer on this? He said, well, he said, do what you want, but they may tell you just to stick to the script. And so I said, all right. So I, I came up with this. I, I used to love this guy named Ed Darien. You know, I'm a, I'm a student of, of broadcasters, of, of PA announcers. I mean, I, I love it. Loved it since I was a kid. Impersonating guys, Bob Murphy. And when I was a kid, I used to entertain my family. So I, I followed the business closely. And I, I looked at Ed Darien, who was this well-known uh, guy. He used to be on these USA Network fights. And he always said the guy's name twice, the second time. That's right. You know, yes. Yeah, you know, that's young, and everyone was a young man or fine gentleman. Like, the guy, the guy just came out of Attica State Prison for twelve years. This fine young man <laughs> hits the scales at an even two hundred eighty-two pounds. This young gentleman. You know? <laughs> so anyway, I took a little Ed Darian and I stuck it in there, and I extended it as long as you possibly could. Instead of saying record zero death zero, I said this young man has a record of zero victories. Oh, no, I think he had one victory and no defeats, you know, I, I, with, a, with a long pause. And they kept it all in. Awesome. So I, 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 I turned my two seconds of fame into maybe 12 seconds. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'm going to let you go into just a couple more questions. I appreciate you taking as much time as you have with me. Um, kind of the question I've been asking, I'm a, I'm a big baseball fan. I grew up in New Jersey, northern New Jersey, just across the river from good old MSG. And... Um, I'm a Mets fan, but I'm now a Diamondbacks fan, and I guess you know where I'm going to go with this. Do you think we're going to get baseball this year? Wait a minute. Hold on. i got to back this up. You are a Mets fan in northern New Jersey. That makes sense. Right. The Diamondbacks beat the Yankees in the World Series. You became a D-back fan? How did that uh, I moved to Arizona in 2000. So I've been out here. I was out here for that 2001 season. The only time oh, Arizona finally, won anything. Man, right. Craig yeah. Council, who, by the way, I just interviewed Craig, and it's on a, at Fox Sports Florida. If I could throw a plug in there on our on our Twitter, and it really we talk about 97, but it's a great uh, half hour interview with the with the guy who was a hero in both uh, Arizona and yes, for was. the Marlins in 97 when he got called up out of obscurity. He was almost 27 years old. So yes, I think we're going to get baseball back. I think we're going to get a half a season. The, the issue here, James, is, uh, number one, of course, is going to be health. They're going to they're have to come up with, you know, distancing, maybe no fans to start out with. I think all that they can come up with some solution. They may have some problems in terms of I just saw the California that I see was the L.A. mayor said nothing for three months. So certain teams are not going to be able to play, it looks like, in their own ballpark. 
Wow. So they got to work out those things. But let's put that aside from a baseball standpoint. The big thing is going to be after they deal with the health is coming up with a way to pay the players where the players will agree to it. Right now, they, they already agreed to a prorated salary. In other words, they play half the season, they get half their money. Oh, wow. Okay. The problem is that is not going to do the trick for the owners because if you pay them half your salary, but you've got nobody at the, at the gate, nobody in the crowd, you can't afford it. It'd be cheaper not to play the games. Mm. But baseball has never had a salary cap. They don't operate on a revenue system like the other three big sports where they get a percentage of the revenue. In baseball, it's open season. The Yanks could pay $250 million for their team, maybe a luxury tax. The Marlins could pay $100 million and everything in between. So the players are going to have to agree, and, and, and history shows you they're not that interested in that. But I hope they do in this case, and they see, if the owners aren't getting fans in the ballpark, how do you, you know, you got to come up with a deal. So I, I just hope the players, the rank and file, get together and understand, first of all, the country needs you. Right. We need baseball back. We all do. We love the game. We need some entertainment when we're home. We're tired of watching Tiger King. There's only seven episodes. <laughs> we, need, we, need, we need something else. And so I hope they can come to a deal. That's my hope. Um, and, and they're working on it. And I, I, would, I would think they will, and we'll get an 81-game season. Sounds like fun. I'm looking forward to it. I've seen a lot of my buddies online saying they're watching empty arena Korean baseball. I'm thinking, as much as I miss baseball, I don't know if I can go that far. So, <laughs> yeah, you know what's weird? You know, last night I've been flipping around. Have you watched any of the late night shows by chance? Uh, yeah, I had one on last night. As a matter of fact, yeah. Uh, well, I, I happened to throw Jimmy Fallon on last night. Jimmy Fallon is, is uh, talented. He's one of the better entertainers. He's a great dancer, a great skit guy. But watching him do a monologue in some awful room where he mm. can't even look up, he's so uncomfortable. You know, we as sportscasters, we're comfortable having a script, potentially looking up and not just reading a script. I don't know why they don't have a prompter for him, but he's looking down at the joke. The delivery is awful. There's no crowd. There's no. It, it, I couldn't believe it. This is the, this is the Tonight Show. Right, exactly. Are and you kidding me? And we both deal in a sonic world, and I'm finding it very difficult to watch these shows when you have that awkward echo, because people are in their, you know, their kitchen or something. I'm thinking, go into yeah, a carpeted room. Right. Go into a. There's not as much echo if there's a carpeted room. <laughs> I mean, this is I mean, how they didn't have a sound guy out there and go put put you know those cushions that they do for sound studios and make it. This is the Tonight Show. This isn't, you know, the Craig Minervini podcast. Right. Or you're not expecting a network quality necessarily talent or or uh, or sound will look, but the, I couldn't believe how how uh, amateurish it looked like a college show. Now, obviously, look, it's tough on any the comedian, you know, without a crowd. I mean, we work in television, not knowing it's always a weird thing what the audience is feeling. You can guess, but you don't get it right back. Mm. Like my brother does stand up, he gets that right back. Right. If the joke bombs, he knows. If he, but when you're in TV, you're doing what we're doing right now. We don't know what the audience is thinking. They may hate this interview. They may have turned it off. They may like it. Right, you exactly. don't find out until you get a letter or a note or you know a tweet, or a tweet. hey, a good, nice interview. So you're used to doing that. But for a comedian, dealing jokes and trying to deliver one-liners and not have it feedback, you can tell it's, it's almost it's torture watching it. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'm going to let you get on with your day because I didn't mean to take you so long. Can I, before I do, can I ask for one final favor from you? Absolutely. You probably know what I'm going to ask for. Do you mind if I ask for a drop? Just of say, course. This is Craig George, and you are listening to the Wrestling Epicenter. No, I meant I mind if you ask for a drop. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I Wait, don't think anybody's ever told me... Yeah, nobody's ever said no to me before yet. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go for the joke. I like to go for the joke. And I grew up in a comedy family, you know, around the comedy club. I, I like the humor. All right, give me that again because you're just telling me that. What, it, what, it's the what? Wrestling the rest Epicenter. And you're okay. Okay. Not your name, just the Wrestling Epicenter. Just the Wrestling Epicenter. Yes, sir. All right. Three, two, one. Hi, everybody. This is Craig DeGeorge, formerly of the WWF and the UWF. And you're listening to the Wrestling Epicenter. What a show. Perfect, man. I thank you so much for your time. I do apologize for going a little long with you, but I do love that you gave me so much time. That's really incredible. 
Hey, it was my long answers, not your questions. I enjoyed the interview, and that's uh, anytime I enjoy an interview, I like talking wrestling with a guy who's prepared. Uh, it's always a lot of fun. So thanks. Thank you. You take care. Thank you so much, and I'll uh, I'll okay, send you a James. Twitter, a tweet, and a, and a Facebook message as soon as I get it up online. Yeah, put put it out, and I'll retweet the uh, interview if you want as well. Direct people. The preceding announcement was paid for by the Wrestling Epicenter. I'm to listen, and if you like what you heard, I'm glad. If you didn't like what you heard, we'll go fuck yourself. <laughs> Most people done hung up on me. <laughs> we had a lovely conversation. <laughs> what a show. Oh, mercy, Daddy. I'm your radio dial. Don't hang up. Bye-bye.